1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 9, and uh, it's on the screen if you would like to uh, just follow along up there, but 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 9 and 10 is where we will spend our time uh, continuing to delve into ideas of identity bias and what does it mean for us to be the church. When you have it, say, I got it. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. I'm reading from the message translation on the screen, but many of our translations should indeed uh, read very similarly. Verse number 9 says, but you are the ones. I like that. Amen. Matrix talk. Amen. Are you the one? Amen. Well, you, we are the ones. Everybody say the ones. The ones. We are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do God's work and speak out for him. To tell others of the night and day difference God made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. Amen. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak... From this simple topic, we are instruments. Tell your neighbor, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name I pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Now, did y'all just see that tweet that came in at the top? No, y'all was praying. Amen. I hope that's not going to be showing up. That's kind of weird. All right. Um, we are instruments. Now, part of what uh, I am always convinced of is that many of us have a significant challenge in remembering who we are, particularly as it relates uh, to the distinctions as the world describes who we are, as your family and them describe who you are, as your neighborhood, as this culture uh, describes who you are, and then how God not just describes who you are, but defines who you are. Now make no mistake about it, these definitions of who we are are always competing for our ultimate loyalties. Uh, these definitions of who we are are always trying to get a, 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 a priority, a, a foothold, a, a privileging, if you will, uh, versus who does God say, think, define, and declare us to be? Now, part of why I find this to be such an important point is because in a world that is becoming increasingly secularized, a world that is becoming post-religious, we are very much unaware of the many ways in which uh, a post-religious context is more uh, than just uh, about which path leads to God. I believe it's, it's, it's even more deeply uh, about how do we really live out who we are created to be. Because if my definition of self is not grounded in the eternal uncreated one, who actually, the scripture says, before I was formed, in my mother's womb, actually knew me, actually understood all of my idiosyncrasies, actually was very clear about all of my contradictions, all of my uh, uh, conundrums, all of those things that would make everybody else scratch their head or have a brain freeze. God was like, oh yeah, I, I remember that. I, yeah, I remember, yeah, 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 yeah. Before anyone knew you, God was aware of who you are. That awareness to me is so much more important than the kind of religious box you check. 
Because if you are not clear about who your origins come from, then you may find yourself chasing after a narrative that will never fully describe who the origin intended you to be. Lord, help me in here today. You see, part of why this uh, conversation about identity is so important, particularly when we're talking about bias, is because for many of us in this capitalistic, consumeristic age, we will buy into the commodification of our identities. We will buy into these, these boxes that, that everyone makes us check whenever we're doing anything. I mean, think about this for a second, right? How many applications must you uh, fill out that always require you to check something? Check if you're male or female. Check if you're from you know, San Francisco or, or Oakland or Berkeley. Check if you've been incarcerated before. Check if you are uh, educated, graduated from high school. Check if, and it's all these checks, and after a while, how many know we get conditioned to think our lives are defined by these boxes we check? But, but ain't there a part of you that can't be defined by a box? Anybody? Is, is there something quantifiable about the uniqueness of who you are created to be that the world can't possibly put into words? It is that part of you, that identity that I want to hone in on today that I believe is an expression and a reflection of Jesus who came as a human, wrapped himself up in flesh, but within him, the scripture says, the fullness of God dwelt, that it is a point of fact that the way that Jesus came to the world could not fit in a box. And it is this Jesus who we now are called to live the rest of our lives following. So I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that if you are a follower of Jesus, you can fill out all the applications and check all the boxes you want to. But there is a calling that we must do that will not be checked by a box. And I want to say and believe and, and hold fast that this calling is for us to be the church. Now being the church as we've gone through it this whole uh, last several uh, weeks or so has all kinds of different connotations, right? We, we talked about what being the church means uh, in me, we're trying to describe it. And this is to me the great example of how if we really are going to be the church, there is no like single definition of what it means to be the church. Being the church means that every day of our lives we are living in a way that follows the ways of Jesus. So we use words, and how many know whenever you start to use words to try to describe the undescribable, you automatically diminish. You begin to make smaller that which is magnanimous, right? That which is a uh, monstrosity, that which is huge and beyond our capacity. But we still need words so we can know what we're talking about. Amen. So, so being in the church, we talk about the environment, caring for the poor, forgiving, rejecting racism, fighting for the powerless, uh, sharing earthly and spiritual resources, embrace diversity, love God, and enjoy this life. We talked about another Sunday that being the church means that we bear God's image that we must steward creation. We talked about how it is important for us to create life and make disciples, overcome evil with good. We talked about how we are called to live in community, one with another, to live nonviolently. And how many of you know, given the continuous incidents of violence in our cities and in other parts of the country, and dare I say, even the world, if there's one thing the church must not only be and advocate for, it is for us to Live nonviolently. Amen. Being in the church, we talked a little bit a couple weeks ago about eliminating bias, seeing the divine within one another, 
Visit prisoners, comfort widows, care for orphans, preach the gospel, defeat the powers, resist the devil, dance, be a peacemaker, and testify. All of these things are reminding us what it means to be the church. And this week, you know, it continues to amaze me. I'm going to park right here a little bit just to talk about the tragedy in Oregon. Because it is indeed a fascinating uh, 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 conundrum and contradiction of these issues of gun violence in our country, how uh, I hear now we are averaging almost a mass shooting a day, amen, according to some, some calculations where multiple people's lives are being taken uh, by individuals with guns. And, and, you know, many of you that have been at the way for a while, you know that we've been very much engaged in these fights around reducing the access, the supply of weapons and guns, militarized weapons and all these assault weapons into our communities. And uh, we continue, I think, to see that there is a very powerful force opposing common sense uh, regulations around weapons and guns. And what's so fascinating to me about this is uh, even with all the carnage that is out here, Amen. We 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 pulled. The, I pulled this out of a training that I was doing back in 2011 and 12. And these, these numbers probably need to be updated a little bit. But just think about this: over 100 people, 100,000 people in America are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, or by police intervention. 31,000 people die from gun violence every year in this country. That is more folk. That, that then many other kinds of causes of death all wrapped up together. About over half of those folks are suicides. So it's obvious that the presence of these weapons in our communities, in our homes, people say I have a gun for, uh, for, for, for safety, amen, but don't you know that if you own a gun, you are more likely for you or your family member to be shot or killed by that gun you own than by the, you know, boogeyman you waiting to break through your door. Amen. I know some of us are like, you don't know, Pastor Mike, I live in Oakland. I live in Oakland too. Amen. 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 And, and 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 I'm here to tell you that the presence of guns and weapons in our homes are more of a public health uh, 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 risk to us than it is to anyone else. And even the sensible things that we as people of faith could advocate for, background checks or making sure folks lock up their weapons, or even report your gun stolen if it gets stolen. Governor Jerry Brown, amen, vetoed that bill last year. Man, we say, you should be required to report your gun if it's stolen. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so he vetoed the bill after making it through the legislation. Maybe, maybe he, 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 next year we'll make another act of God on him, amen, and, and get some of this stuff pushed through. But, but I guess my point is this that in the public imagination, when we see who are the folks that seem to be just so against gun legislation, it seems to be people who name the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Followers of the Prince of Peace can't imagine living without their peace. It is Quite a contradiction <laughs> that we who are called listen in scripture to work for a day when our swords are turned into plowshares. Where our weapons of war in Isaiah chapter 2 uh, verse number 4 it says that we as followers of God we are praying and we are acting in ways where those Weapons and those tools that are used to take life can eventually be turned into plowshares. Tools that are able to actually create sustenance, create crops, create life. What then must you and I be called to do if we are going to actually fulfill this 
mandate to be the church. Against this backdrop, you and I must understand that the swords into plowshares all are tools. A sword, a weapon is a tool, but so is a plowshare. So is a, a plow, a, a, a shovel, a, a, a pick, if you want, all tools, instruments that can create the kind of world that God has called for us to have. It is in this way then that I believe that being the church must then be something that can be described continuously as something like this. We must be like Jesus. Wouldn't it be something if you and I woke up every day and while we're looking in the mirror getting our, you know, our, our, ourselves together and, you know, we, you know, got our Pinterest up or we got our, our, our magazines up and we're trying to figure out how the style, whose style we're going to borrow today, praise God. What, what, what magazine style is in, you know, uh, should I have this dress on or this, this sweater on? Uh, wouldn't it be something that one of the first things you did that morning was to open up your other magazine or book? and figure out how can me, we today, be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 It's a little quiet in here. Amen. Is that too hard of an ask for the people of God to wake up every day and wrestle with what does it mean for me to be like Jesus. To be an instrument of God in the world that is able to fight the good fight, which means that there are some fights that you should not find yourself fighting. How many know that not every fight is equal? And all of us out here who are always looking for a fight, tell your neighbor you got to fight the good fight. I love the qualifier on there. Some of us got to learn to let some fights go. I know some of y'all don't want to touch your neighbors. You just pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to let it go. Amen. <laughs> what does it mean for us to make sure we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth? To rejoice with those who rejoice yes. and to weep with those who weep. That's what it means to be the church. It don't mean that when you are upset that you know, uh, you, 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 or when other folk is upset, you just walking around oblivious to the upside down nature of their lives. But what does it mean for us to enter into the pain with other people? Uniquely called to be the church. Now, I, I love this passage of scripture that we've read because particularly when we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we know and we see that there's a background to this particular passage. 1 Peter, many believe, is, is written to the audience, one generation, who is after Jesus has gone off the scene. So many people are trying to figure out, all right, we expected Jesus, we saw him ascend, and we expected him to come back. He said he was coming back. Where are you at? Jesus taking too long. And I done moved my whole life around. Waiting on Jesus to come back. Come on, Jesus. Anybody ever had that kind of, you know, private prayer conversation? You done moved your whole life around. Because you heard the preacher say that Jesus is going to make it all right. Oh, Jesus, he's going he gonna, to he gonna turn it around. Jesus, late in the midnight hour, he's going to turn it around and around and around and around. And you was turning around and you was all, you know, you was just, yes, Jesus. And then Jesus ain't did it yet. And you're like, come on, Jesus. Anybody? Is that just me? Amen. All right. This is the audience of 1 Peter chapter 2. And many of them are thinking of throwing in the towel. Because they feel like this Jesus thing ain't all this cracked up to be. 
Some of them are realizing that people are being killed for following Jesus. People are losing their homes and their businesses. It was such a risk during this time to follow Jesus that they had their services in cemeteries. Because that was the only place where the Roman soldiers were scared to go. What do you think about that for a second, right? That the risk associated following Jesus and Peter, the message that was kept and held and captured and proclaimed by Peter and the disciples and followers of Peter said this to those who were listening. You are a chosen generation. One person says a chosen race. The one I read said, you are the ones. Which makes me, for the first point, lift up that if we're going to be the church, we must make an impression. We must be a witness that we are the ones. If I say we are the ones, we are the ones. Now, now understand what, what, what I love about this first kind of expression of being the church if we unpack what it means for the text to say we are a chosen generation, a chosen race, we are the ones, it is literally speaking about the kind of subcultures that the people of God are called to exist within. That we are the chosen generation. There is never a generation that is not called to be God's people. I love the proclamation that so many are quick to put out that the millennials are leaving the church. That, that, that this generation, there's a great falling away. But as a student of history, I know that every generation always felt like folk were leaving the church. And it's probably because some churches were worth leaving. <laughs> I wish I had some help in you today. How many of you know what was it, Nina Simone that said, you ought to get up from the table when love is not being served there any longer? Ain't that what Sister Nina said? You see, it's so important for us to appreciate that the church is not dictated by human constructions. Today we're going to celebrate communion, Eucharist, on the first Sunday of every month. We do that here as a practice to remind us that we, the church, is more than the way Christian Center. It's more than some black folk and some white folk and some straight folks and some rich folk. The church is God's body. And we are called to be the church in every generation. In every race that God has engineered, Lord have mercy, some people who can, within the culture they are living, be the church. That God does not want our identities to be so consumed by what the world describes that we forget that whether I'm a millennial or a boomer, I'm called to follow the ways of Jesus. Hmm? Whether I'm rich or poor, I'm called to follow the ways of Jesus. Whether I am from America or from Latin America, or let me say the United States, or from South America, Brazil, Africa, Asia, Antarctica. I don't know if there are folk who live up there still. <laughs> but wherever you are, we must make an impression within the culture that we're placed. We have to be a witness that every generation. Franz Fernand, he, he says it best, I like it, he says that each generation out of relative obscurity must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Now I want you to think about this for a second. If we are called to be the church in every single generation, every single time period, at some point, the millennials that are quote unquote leaving the church must still even in their own obscure journeys of faith must find the ways to follow Jesus in ways that are faithful to the culture in, and it will be a prophetic manifestation. 
It will always be abrasive. Following Jesus will always be abrasive against whatever culture or place you're in. When following Jesus makes you so comfortable in whatever culture you're in, I want to argue you are not following Jesus. Hello, somebody. You're not following the one that ended up on the cross. <laughs> Man, Jesus loved everybody. He did. But Jesus' love still ended up with him being on the cross. Usually if you love folk like that, you just kind of, you know, die of old age. Ain't <laughs> hey, interesting how all the folks we revere in history, we sanitize them. And we remove the, the controversial abrasiveness of their moral lives. I mean, God be not violent fellow, but you know, he was not considered, you know, a nice hero to the British. Dr. King. Oh, well, everybody loved him some Dr. King. But remember, the most respectable Negro. Arguably in the history of the United States, they still ended up blowing him away. So let us not sanitize what it means to follow the ways of God. You must make an impression as the chosen ones of your generation. Huh, give your neighbor a high five and tell them, make an impression, make an impression, make an impression. And you can't make an impression as a follower of Jesus unless you receive the Spirit of God who will empower you to be God's witnesses. Huh? So understand that as we strive to be the church and be witnesses and make an impression, as we discover our mission, as we fulfill it, we will always need God's spirit. You can't do it on your own, my brothers and sisters. You can't do it through your own strength or your own intellect or your own connections. You will always, as a follower of Jesus, need to rely on the Spirit. This is one of the first things I think we're called to be the church. The second thing that I love in this passage, it says, you are a royal priesthood. Everybody knows what it means to be a priest. It means you intercede on behalf of the people. You and I are called to stand in the gap. Everybody say that, stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. In the gap. For those who find themselves apart from wherever life is. We are called to be bridge builders. I know some folk relish in the, the antagonistic Christ against culture. If I were to pull out some Nie Niebuhr, Reinhold Niebuhr. Huh. Yeah, Reinhold Niebuhr. He had these distinctions of how the church was to be. Christ in culture, Christ with, uh, Christ against culture, Christ, uh, a few other cultures. <laughs> and there has been this orientation that the church is often called to be over and against the world. And there are moments and times we're supposed to be that. But how many of you know there are also times where we are to be the bridges? In your everyday life, how would people describe you? Are you a wall builder or a bridge builder? On your job, are you the person that they come to when folks are trying to resolve conflict? Or are you the one they come to when they try to start conflict? Hello, somebody. In your family, when there is difference that arises, you know them cousins 
that we don't like too much? Mm -hmm. Or even how many of us have siblings that don't get along with our parents? Anybody? Thank God. Amen. For, you know, I mean, that's, that's some real stuff. In our marriage relationships, right? We are all called to ask God to empower us to build bridges. Wouldn't it be something if Jesus did not build a bridge for us? To make it back into right relationship with God? What if Jesus saw the wall of enmity, the scripture says, the wall of hostility, the wall of division, and Jesus said, nope, that's a good wall. I'm going to keep that wall in place. Yeah, I'm going to make sure that the Jew and the Greek never get together. The male and the female never can work things out. The rich and the poor will always be in hierarchical, exploitative relationships. What if Jesus just said, yeah, that, that's cool, and I'm just going to come and die on the cross to just make sure, you know, mm, that uh, they got a good example. No. No, the work of Jesus on the cross was more than an example. It was a work to undo, to tear down the wall of hostility. And if we're going to be the church, my brothers and sisters, we can't, as Isaac Newton says, build too many walls and not enough bridges. Too many walls, not enough bridges. I want to submit to you today that the hardest thing to do is to build stuff. When we were modeling the sanctuary, you know, I was fascinated by how quick they tore everything down. And, you know, I was, you know, I'm not a, a builder like that, so, you know, I, I just couldn't really appreciate it all. Uh, but, you know, I was always worried about our timeline for our construction project. And, you know, uh, when they got in here, they started tearing down the ceiling and tearing down the walls, and they finished it all in two days. I was like, oh, Jesus, come on, somebody. Hey, man, this thing lightning quick. Turbo. But it took them forever. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. To put it back together again. To build something new. It was easy to tear something down. But it was difficult to build it up. That's a word for somebody here today. Be careful how your identity over associates you with building walls, with living within walls, over you embracing what God is calling us to be, which are bridge builders. Now, I acknowledge that there are, there's a reason why construction sites, people have to wear hard hats, because there is great risk when you are constructing things. Hello, somebody. You're not always able to compensate for your full environment when you are building things. There may be unintended hurt and harm that comes your way when you are trying to build something. But I love the word of God where it says that except the Lord builds the house, we that are working are laboring in vain. Which means that if you and I are being the church, building some things, building bridges, if we are closing the gaps that exist between the other, however we define that, if God is in the midst of your building, even those moments or those times that may cause you some unintended pain. 
same, God can take that thing that was intended for your evil and turn it into a good. God knows how to redeem you and I when we are being faithful to the call of God. And it is not the case that you and I will be always protected. I know, you know, this is kind of one of these, these, you know, aspirational myths we put out there, you know, that you will never have any harm come near you. These are the words of scripture for sure. And yet history and experiences teaches us that we still experience harm. So how do you and I hold in tension the harm that we experience by being faithful to God and the deliverance that is automatic to that same faithfulness? After all, you wouldn't need to be delivered if you weren't in trouble. Huh? So let's have the expectation that whether I'm in trouble or whether I'm being delivered, God will take good care of his church. Hallelujah. Isaiah 58 verse 12 defines powerfully this idea that you will rebuild the ancient ruins. Raise up age old foundations. You will be called repairers of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. My brothers and sisters, we are called to restore, to build bridges, to repair. And my hope and prayer for us is as we strive to be the church, we can imagine what is our unique role in doing this. Finally, the last thing we are called to be holy. Ooh, somebody holler, holy. We are a holy nation. We are called to pursue holiness. And I can dig into the res reserves of my holiness Pentecostal upbringing. Ah, and talk about holiness. And talk about what holiness really means to the saints of old out of our Holiness Pentecostal Methodist traditions. John Wesley and the Wesley boys over there in England, they were early proponents of holiness, personal piety. This idea that your life should not just be contaminated with all of the things of the world. So they put these, 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 uh, 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 admonitions against drinking and against smoking and against gambling because in their time and place they realized as the church that they had many families who were not able to pay their bills because the men were out there drinking and gambling rent away. Let's give you some history how holiness became redefined as a series of actions. It was a practical pastoral admonition. And then holiness began to get associated with a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Before folks understood Pentecostalism to be an expression of speaking in tongues, there are many Christian traditions that understood that when you were filled with the Holy Ghost, you practiced holiness. That the Holy Spirit made you holy. Took the taste of liquor out your mouth and chasing women out your mouth. And it was always over associated with the men. Amen. And I think there's a little tale there about men's morals. Praise God. I, you know, sisters, I, I, I think y'all pretty all right. Praise the Lord. And then there was this other expression of holiness that then was associated with speaking in tongues and, and all these, these other kinds of, again, personal piety. And I, I hold on to those things as important descriptions of what you and 
and I must lean into, which is consecration. To pursue holiness is to pursue a life that is consecrated, set apart for the special use and purposes of God. Now it does not necessarily narrowly mean that all the admonitions around personal piety, whether it is the liquor or the 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 uh, 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 practices of, of gambling and all, like you know, there's some folk who still hold on to those things as the benchmark of holiness. And if that's what you need to hold on to, hold on to it. Because I don't want you gambling your own brain away. I don't want you getting so drunk that you are hurting yourself or other people. Domestic Violence Awareness Month, don't you know that the overwhelming majority of cases where domestic violence is involved, the presence of substances, abuse, is there. That don't mean that, you know, Liquor in and of itself is evil. It just means that for many, many people, when you start drinking that spirit, not the Holy Spirit, it does something to your... And y'all know I'm telling the truth. I mean, I know we in church and whatnot. And some of y'all been real tight. And Pastor Preacher don't drink and stuff. I, I mean, I'm not telling you you can't drink. I'm just telling you that some of us need to be aware of what holiness is trying to get you and I to reach for. A life that is set apart for the special purposes of God in the world. You and I are called to live our lives in ways, as this pastor says, Every effort to live in peace with everyone and pursue holiness for without which no one can see the Lord. Think about this. Without holiness, you can't see the Lord. Unless you are set apart, seeing God is a challenge. Think about this. This should make sense to us. Unless I create time in my life to be set apart, God will be hard for me to see. If you can't see God, how can you be the church? looking for some people who are willing within the cultures, the races, the generations of our day to be willing to be set apart for the special purposes so we can see God. I can see Jesus in the air I breathe. In the water I drink. In the sun that shines. I can see Jesus in my trouble. I can see Jesus in my triumphs. I can see Jesus through the tears that come out of my eyes. I can see Jesus through the laughter. I can see Jesus through every part of my life. Because when you're set apart then you begin to distinguish between that which is not God and that which is. And I believe God's trying to get a few of us in here to make every effort to not be so consumed with every other enterprise of your life that you don't take time out to be set apart. Oh, Lord. I, I, I... I love this peach cobbler that, that, was, that was made for me. And it reminds me of, of, of the 
Thanksgiving holidays, you know, when we used to, to, to get all kinds of good food and, 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 and you know, uh, my grandmother always made us some sweet potato pie. Lord help me today, amen. And, 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 and it, was, it was peach cobbler, sweet potato pie, and they always was good to me. But, but, you know, because there was about a dozen, two dozen folk in our family, amen, there was always a number of grimy heads who were always trying to eat what was intended, I think, to be for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and, and in the middle of all of the griminess and the coughing and the, you know, <laughs> on, on the, the stuff, I would always appreciate that, that there was a, 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 a little bit of pie or cobbler that was wrapped up into saran wrap that was, that was set aside for Michael McBride. Lord, touch your neighbor somebody. And I want to believe that God wants to take you and put you in some saran wrap for a little while and set you aside so the world does not contaminate you with all of the evil and all of the trouble and all of the hurt and the pain that will try to keep you from seeing God. God is trying to get somebody to understand that if you're going to be the church, you need to pull yourself away for a little while and seek him first and his kingdom and his ways. You need to become just as familiar with him as you are with your favorite sports team, as you are with your favorite hip-hop producer, as you are with your favorite reality television personality, as you are with your favorite TV show. God is trying Trying to get the church to realize that you can't be the church uh, if you're so consumed with your own work uh, that you don't understand what God is calling you to be. Yeah. And if we can pursue God in this way, yeah, then I believe we can be the church in the world in a totally different kind of a way. I think you and I can start to see that our faithfulness to God can spill over into justice in the world. Our faithfulness to our families can spill over into restoration of relationships. Our faithfulness to our communities can spill over into healing and restoration. But it requires that we got to be the church. Do I have anybody that understands that we've got to be the church and if you are going to be the church then you got to put your eyes on the things that God loves I'm not going to focus on the things that God has already rejected but God said when you were outside I brought you all the way in God says when you were not my people I made you my chosen ones and I believe God has chosen somebody who's willing to be the church uh, who's willing to hold on to the identity that God has given you. Uh, you are more than your race. Uh, you are more than your gender. Uh, you are more than your sexual orientation. Uh, you are more than your uh, bank account. Uh, you are more than your national origin. Uh, but you are a child of the living God. Uh, and if God is on your side uh, then you have the power to be the church somebody shout hallelujah be the church be the church be the church